Okay, um, a bit more people than I thought actually. This is a pretty boring subject. Okay, so I'm, um, I'll, I'll do the commercial since the company's paying for me to be here. Um, I'm CTO of a Malaysian software company. Uh, some of our applications are written in Python, not all of them. Um, but what backs all our applications is databases, relational ones, not no SQL ones. So in the end, we have to uh, talk SQL. So um, my life is spent buried in them. OK, so for most Python programmers, uh, the way you access a relational database is through an object relational mapper. So you, you might do the Django style. So um, you're detached from the database. You do your models. You're probably not even thinking too hardly about what your database schema looks like. Um, if you're not in Django land, then maybe you're more this style of uh, object relational management, so that SQL alchemy. But the interesting thing about all these uh, ORMs is in the end they use one thing in common, and they have to execute SQL if you're dealing with a relational database. And so, again, a lot of programmers who are dealing with the ORM have no idea what's going on underneath the hood. But it's um, basically running SQL, structured query language, um, it's a domain-specific language. It's a very powerful language if you want to learn things from it. You can achieve a lot with pure SQL that if you are writing in your ORM, you'll be battling with. Get your queries right, performance of your app will just go through the roof. So, you know, how do we do this in Python? So, Way back when I started using Python, there was different ways of accessing uh, the database. There were some proprietary things. And then what came on the scene was the DB API. And there was a version 1. And pretty fast after that, there was version 2. And this was sort of modeled on, in Perl, the Perl world, there was a DB API so that you could write code almost across database. OK, and I'll, I'll say almost. Uh, you had to think hard about it, and um, it's all based on a PEP 249. Really worthwhile reading it. If you, uh, well, it's very well written. Um, it's been visited a lot of times, and things corrected when there's any misunderstandings. Uh, and the majority of the database adapters now implement this API compliant to version two. There's still the odd one out there that um, has proprietary, but they tend to have a proprietary and a DB API too compliant interface. So in most cases when you're dealing with the database, so when you run Django or you run SQL Alchemy or Storm or any of the other ORMs, underneath the DB API is the thing that makes it work and allows you to pick pretty well whatever database you want. It's because of this, think of it as an open database, data interface layer. Now, as close as I'm going to get to technical, um, this is uh, a diagram that was done by uh, a guy a while ago. It's gone missing on the internet, so I um, recreated it out of, <laughs> out of uh, um, a copy that I had printed. Um, and what's quite nice about it, it it's, it's a good thing to look at when you want to know what all the methods are, what the globals are. You, yes, you can read the PEP. Yes, you can read the documents on whatever particular uh, DB API you're using, but this one's like the nice little cheat sheet. Without fail, if I step away from Python programming and I come back, I always get the, the fetch method wrong. For I always forget it's called fetch one. I'll go fetch or fetch next or <laughs> and get it wrong. So this is a nice little cheat sheet. So the, uh, the credit's there for Travis because he spent all the time doing it. Um, 2006, I think this was done. OK, so the DB API defines basically a module and uh, two classes. All right? And so basically, uh, the module has some globals. And then what you have is you have a connection object. All right? And this is the really important one. So I'm, I'm using um, Postgres as my example database. But just change the name of the database adapter in front and pretty well anything that I'm talking about here on uh, the slides will work with 
the database that you prefer to use because of the DB API. So you, you have a connect constructor and you have a series of parameters that you put in. These parameters tend to be database specific. Um, there's been talk about having a more uh, standard way of uh, setting up a connection to a database. So this is what is a database, maybe what is the schema, who is the user, what's the password to get in, what host is it running on, what port is the database on. Um, Alchemy actually has a very nice URI method of actually writing all this down in a very sort of cross database way. And it would probably be nice if DB API version 3 came up with something like that. But it's fairly close. It's all those things that I talked about. There's a way to do it. Um, you sometimes need to go and look at the docs for the particular API about what those parameters are that you put in. Uh, the ma so you create this connection to your database. All right? To actually manipulate anything on the database, you have to create a cursor. Okay. Um, depending on how deep you are into uh, SQL programming, uh, in a lot of cases, you would think a cursor is something that you iterate through a result set. In the DB API, the cursor is the thing that you react to the database with in most cases. All right, well, we'll talk about some of the little ones off to the side. Um, so you have to create a cursor if you're going to do a select or an insert or an update or a delete. Okay. The other thing is the connection is where we handle the transaction management. All right. So the very important thing about relational databases is, is ACID. And to get your consistency in that and to guarantee that what you put into the database uh, commits properly because you might be updating multiple tables, you have to be in a transaction. All right. Some databases allow you to run not in that mode but I seriously recommend you should always be running in that. So it does what's called an implicit be begin. Okay, so every time that you uh, create your cursor, the assumption is that there has been a commit and we're ready to go again. Okay, so your transaction has started, then every single operation that you do, insert, update, delete, select, until you say commit, it hasn't actually taken effect in the database, hopefully for anybody else to see. Depends what isolation you have on your database. Okay. If something goes wrong, an exception pops up, or uh, you get an error or a check, you can roll that whole transaction back. Okay. So basically, you do that on the connection object. Right. And so the main thing to um, remember is that the connection, any cursors you create on a connection object, are all to that one database connection. So that all the actions on the multiple cursors are all under that one big transaction. Because in most cases, the connection object is the only thing that you can do transaction control on. Some database adapters also have it on cursors, but that's for a specific um, reason. So I, I would suggest staying back from that unless you really know what you're doing. Um, and then there's the close, right? So the tidy up, it's like anything, we should tidy up things properly. So um, you need to close your database connection. Not the end of the world if you don't, but um, could be the cause of some interesting memory leaks if you, do, if you uh, don't do that very nicely. Especially with web-based apps, where in a lot of cases, connections are opening, opening and closing quite a lot, unless you're running connection pools. The other thing is you can check the capabilities of the module, all right? So um, this is up on the actual database adapter itself, not on the connection object. I actually made a mistake when I made these slides and I forgot and I, I said it was. But basically you say what is the API level? Most of them will say two. All right? There's the odd one that will say one. Thread safety, be really careful. Not all the database APIs are truly multi-thread safe. Okay, so you need to check that and you need to make decisions about that in your code. Again, ORMs tend to protect you a little bit on that. And then the other one which is uh, the parameter style which we'll talk about and a little while. Okay, so the yep. yep. Yes, yes, it is. It, the, those are um, required uh, items. In most cases, most people don't check them apart from the param style, which we'll go into. So I said that the second object is your cursor. Okay, so this is the one that you do all the um, actions on. 
And as I said, as the cursors are not isolated as individual things, because they are attached to a connection. Okay, so you can have multiple cursors open, and you can be doing things on the, on the uh, database, and it's within your session, so you will see the changes that you're making. Nobody else will, and you either commit or roll back on that. So it allows you to do some quite interesting, complex things, which are a little bit harder with uh, object relational mappers. Uh, so pretty easy to uh, create a cursor. Um, you just call the method, and sitting in the, the variable is your cursor object. Now on that, you can execute a whole lot of methods. And so basically, the, the standard one is you have your SQL code, which would be where your operation is, and you pass some parameters to it and it's going to return a result. And then the uh, fetch methods basically allow you to act on that result to return things. Also, a lot of the uh, DB APIs, they will actually return iterators on a cursor, so you can actually iterate through it, uh, through the object itself. And then you also have a cursor close, okay? And keeping good behavior and tidying up. Uh, there are optional cursor methods. Not all of them support it. Uh, scroll, a scroll cursor is a special type of cursor in um, SQL, which allows you to go backwards and forwards. So normally, by default, your cursors would only allow you to go forwards. Okay? And with a, with a scroll, you can also go relative and absolute. So quite handy if you're next thing through. Um, then there's a, a next on the cursor, which um, is probably just something sitting on top of the iterator. Uh, as I said, most things happen through the cursor when you're doing a database operation, but there is this optional method where you can call a stored procedure. Okay? So that's what call proc is, and as I said, iterators can be supported, and in most cases with the DP APIs I've used, I've never had to think about it. I've put a four on something and it's just worked. So that's a good thing. Um, the results of an operation. So you do one of those executes, and you do a fetch. You can then read some um, attributes on the uh, cursor object. And so description gives you a, a sequence of each column. So what's its name? How big is it? Does it allow nulls? Things like that. And it also may be um, annotated with other uh, things that the DB API might feel that are worthwhile putting in. Some return just a plain uh, list, others will return a list of objects, um, so sometimes you have to think a little bit about how you extract the data from it. Uh, row count, um, Malcolm and I were having a talk about that today, uh, depending on how the person wrote the database adapter and depending on the underlying C libraries, it can be a fast operation or a slow operation. Uh, it is actually optional because the slow operation is called select count from the table, which is not always very fast. And for a while there, there was a certain database adapter that had that problem. But, right. yep. Uh, by optional, you mean the database driver writer? Decides he decides whether he t returns zero or the real row count. And sometimes databases will return a uh, prediction of how many rows they. But the other methods also yep. mean that it might not be Description will always be there. OK. But uh, sc scroll is a, it's a cursor method that those are definitely optional. These, are, these exist as attributes. You're not going to get a um, need to, um, uh, uh, so that you know. Those three here will always be there. Uh, sc scroll quite, I, I, yeah, and no, I'm, I'm, I need oh, to say, I, I don't use my SQL, so um, um, yeah. The, the last one, last row ID. So when you're using any auto number column or sequence column or serial number column, that gives you the unique ID that came back from the last insert that you did where a row had that in it. The other thing is some of the adapters have proprietary uh, optional methods. Um, it's, a, it's a good thing because there are some things that some of the databases do. But if you're trying to write uh, cross database code, just Remember, if you see this wonderful uh, thing, so there's four update cursors and things like that, look at the other database adapters and decide whether you've got to do that based on what the adapter actually is. Okay, so um, 
jumped. Okay, so I said there was that uh, global attribute called parameter solves. Okay, so basically this is so that you can bind variables to placeholders in your SQL code. All right, and normally this would be in a where clause or sometimes in the, in the values for it. Um, it improves performance because databases, good databases tend to cache query strings with the same values. And if you pass down the placeholders to it, they will pre-fetch that information and they hold it in the um, actual database engine. So all the, op all the decisions made about optimizations are already there. And so if you pass down the cursor with these placeholders in and then your variables, it's going to be more efficient at extracting from the database. Security is an important one. So this is straight out of the Postgres thing. You should never use string concatenation. Think SQL injection. Okay. If you use the parameter style bindings, which I'll go into in a minute, is the thing is you are immediately improving the security on your database as far as SQL injection goes. And also the other thing that it does is it, it uh, knows what the variable types are and you don't have to think about do I need to put quotes around a string things like that, okay? So it does the binding because in the end at the low level C API, you've got to allocate uh, space for the data variables, you've got to say what the data variables are, and in a lot of cases when you do that as a pure SQL string, it's because it's got quotes or you saying I need to cast to something, all right? So um, always do this. So there's a number of parameter styles, uh, and that's what the values you'll get in front there. So you get Q mark if the placeholder is a question mark in the string. So like in the where clause, where country code two equals question mark, the, the first variable that you pass across when you make your uh, um, execute on your cursor would go into that placeholder. That's pretty well the standard way databases have tended to do it for a long, long time. Uh, you can have a numeric positional style, uh, a name style, something that's more like the ANSI C and then the um, Pi format style where you can have the, um, like the name variables you'd use in the Python string. Yep. Uh, are they, is that inconsistent across the different databases? No, you, you need to check the param style. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of like And because of that, um, and you'll even see a piece of code where I do it, a lot, a lot of people will just fall down to basically building strings. Um, yeah. but, if you, but if you check, it's relatively easy, and, and this is what a lot of the RRMs are doing. They know what the param style is, is they build the query up, they put the correct param style in. Okay, so, um, yeah, it's, it varies. I, it, a lot of them now tend to be going for Pi format. The other thing, they may also support multiple ones. Okay, so the, um, what it's actually pointing to is it's, it's, in some respects, the preferred format string that they want, not the end of it. A lot of them will support one one of the format strings in probably QMark. And I, as I was talking to Malcolm today, I wonder if it, the QMark that has passed it straight down in the database and set up the data variables. Okay, so, and as I said, there's a bad example in my one. No, Malcolm and I decided it wasn't a bad example. But, um, so, I mean, this is the type of uh, dance you go through when you are uh, manipulating a database with the DB API. So, pretty simple, we import the modules that we want. Um, a lot of them, date handling, you've got to have the date time module because you need, uh, when the object's returned, it's returned as a date time object and you need to manipulate it. So, pretty well, most of your code, you'll see import the date time module up at the top. Um, I said about the connection string. So, for the um, Postgres, for this particular Postgres adapter, we have to give the database name, the user and the password, and because my Postgres database is running on local host and on the standard port, I don't have to say that. We, um, once we've got a connection, uh, we open the cursor. So I really should be all wrapped in a lot more exceptions, but it didn't fit on the slide. Uh, then, uh, it's support, a lot of database adapters support the with statement, so it actually simplifies your logic a bit. Not all of them do, but the majority of them do. So in this case, I, what I want to do is I want to load data from a text file and insert it into a database, which is a fairly standard thing that I do a lot of. So I use the Python CSV reader, and we basically iterate through that. 
And because this uh, file that I'm using has comments in it, I want to ignore those. And then, they, and I also have to convert one of the strings to a date time to insert properly. And then I execute the insert. And as I said, it's, it's good and bad. But what I'm doing is the rows of my value I'm replacing in, in the, the values for the SQL. Okay? So um, I, what I find people that have been using RMs don't even know what an insert statement looks like. That's, that's what's happening under the, under the hood. Uh, and then depending on if we get an exception, we need to roll back. Otherwise, we do our commit and then finally close both the cursor and the connection. Okay. And then we have a select. So that the first one was basically a, um, a data manipulation operation. Uh, here is a select. Okay, so um, nothing fancy about it. As I said, is same sort of thing. Create the connection, create the cursor, execute my query. Okay, so in this one, it's a string I've already got because I just want Singapore out of this particular table, and then we're just iterating through the cursor and printing out the results of it. So, um, you know, if you need to do those sort of one-time scripts and things, um, it's much easier than sitting there trying to do it with, the o, with your ORM. The other thing is, you know, if you don't know SQL, you can pretty well look at anywhere on, on Google, find out about SQL. If you understand this, or the insert one, because update's very similar, you can pretty well do a, your own um, replacement and make it work. Big thing to remember about queries, they don't care if you get it wrong. So if you go away and it's a, a trillion row table and you go select with no where clause, guess what's going to happen, guys? Um, <laughs> so think some of the databases you can, they will have things on. Um, database administrators put things on for bad programmers to stop you bringing it to its knees, but some don't. Yeah. Um, so. The next thing that we'll sort of just zip through is I, I, I sort of wanted to just have a quick talk about all the database adapters. It's all on the slides, so I won't go in any great detail. Um, so out of the box, if you want to play in every Python distribution since 2.5 and in the three versions is um, SQLite. Okay, so simple database to play with. A lot of the web frameworks, it's the out of the box. Um, to-do list, always uses SQLite. Um, amazing little database for what it does, um, but be careful how many rows you put in it. As soon as you do that, you start looking at a real database. Uh, I have a bias to PostgreSQL, um, but it's not, not anything because it's better or worse, it's just um, for, an open, for the open source database, it feels more like the enterprise -y databases I also work with. Uh, I didn't realize how many adapters there were. Uh, I only knew of two. Um, there's a lot of slides. Um, so PsychoPG, the version two of it, that's what most of the frameworks and ORMs tend to use as their Postgres adapter out of the box. Um, it is also, and I need to be careful here, the one that I know is level two thread safe and really is level two thread safe. Okay, so basically in a really multi-threaded application where, where there's a lot of heavy performance stuff going on, this is the one that people will tend to use. Okay? Um, sometimes building it can be a challenge, uh, but it's got better. Um, and also what I've tried to do is to go whether they're Python 2 or 3. And if I had given this talk a year ago, there would not have been many three adapters out there. Um, so it was quite pleasant to discover that there were more. Um, they tend to be a wrapper on top of C. Okay? But um, Py Postgres SQL is actually all written in Python, and it will optimize to see if the, uh, if the compiled things are there. Um, and it, it was designed from the ground up for Python 3. And it's written by one of the Postgres guys, who at the time was unhappy with the st what he felt the state of the DB APIs were, which I've, I've sort of questioned. Um, it has a couple of nice little um, features, one of which is a, a little console, so you can basically sit there and fiddle with um, Postgres in the command line. 
Um, these are the older ones, still work fine, but I have indicated where if there hasn't been any activity on. One of the nice things about database interfaces, they tend to stay backward compatible for quite a long time. So there's, there's nothing wrong with the fact that something was last released was in 2006, maybe because it's very stable. But I just wanted to sort of give a history of, of where it's at. As I said, there's a lot. I discovered two more today. Um, yeah, so the interesting one about these two, they also work for Pi, with PyPy. And the reason they work with PyPy is they do their uh, wrapper on top of the database C libraries using C types. Yes? What has been the motivation of these developers to write the adapter for the same Postgres SQL? Like, is it easy? Because I, I can write a better one, I think is probably the. Pardon? I can write a better one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no. It, Programmer egos, and, and it's a good thing. It does give a bit of competition. Certainly a lot of them, you know, so you, you see like this one up the top here, it's got an extension API that makes it compatible with PsychoPG2 because that means then it could work with Django or with SQL Alchemy. Um, and, I mean, somebody has taken um, PsychoPG2 and created a similar version using uh, C-types. Originally it started out as an exercise to get Postgres running under PyPy. Um, and it has a little compatibility layer that you import, so it behaves exactly like PsychoPG2. Yep. Uh, so it's like a PG2 and yeah. 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 Well, very, very similar to Rich's talk about um, graphics libraries this morning. Same sort of thing as, as I said, the build used to be a time whenever I had to go and build. Um, a Postgres adapter it was sort of a sucking in and breath of hoping that all the libraries were there and then if I was in Ubuntu you always had to do go an AP app get of something because it was missing. Um, but it, it has got better. Um, a lot of the things that have C have got, the builds have got a lot better. Okay, MySQL, um, three of them. Um, I could not, I cannot honestly tell you which is the most used one. Okay, it's not, not a database that I deal with but um, Lots of people use it and get good results, so uh, I'm sure they, they will be fine. Um, the other enterprise databases, so there's one for Oracle, um, one for Infamix. I've, I've written various wrappers for this one, so that's what I do. It's the database we use a lot of. Um, so even in the release 2007, it stayed courtesy of the, the adapter. Um, IBM has developed an open source one, which is both uh, DB2 and Infamix. Uh, the good old faithful, um, there's an ODBC set of adapters. Um, and so because of the Linux ODBC equivalents, it's always a fallback if there isn't a um, specific one for the database. Uh, if you do Jython, there's a couple of adapters for that. Um, the nice ones about that, because they use JDBC, uh, you don't have to worry too much about is there a connection for my database. As long as there's a JDBC driver, it will be there. Uh, I am Python, there's a specific um, ADO DB API that uh, works on that. I, I know a little bit about that because I worked on some of the original stuff for that. Okay, just a couple of things to finish off with is there's some other little nice things that you get with the, the concept of the DB API. People out there have gone and created little tools that use the DB API. So uh, a friend of mine, he has a thing called Gerald the Half Schema open source programmers, why they come up with these names, who knows. Um, but basically what this does is it allows you to read a schema in, or schemas, and you can basically make queries on the structure and things like that. So one of the things that you can do is you can compare two schemas and it just gives you a list of what all the differences of those two schemas are. I know Andy's dream is that in the end it would be able to tell you how to move one schema to another schema. But they are low-level call, so you could actually do that if you wanted, wanted to. I use it a little bit. It's a great little tool for going, why do we keep falling over the number of values do not insert into the number of columns? And you're interested, what he's done is he's put the um, SQL alchemy style of making a connection into the library and then breaks it down uh, to the thing. This is quite cool, SQL Python. Okay, so um, it gives you a console view into a database and currently supports three of the, of the database APIs. And 
The reason it's only three is because it uses Gerald underneath for doing all the um, schema inspection. But really nice, I mean, basically what you can do is you, you run it up. It's modeled on Oracle's um, SQL Plus, which is their command line tool. And so you can just basically key queries in and you can see the results. Now, one of the reasons I use this, which is what this bottom one is, if I put slash J on the end, I can output the result set in JSON. So if you need a dump of data out of a table from in JSON, you don't have to go write the script, go into here, dump it out. Does XML, CSV, tad delimited, so quite a nice one of that. Now we're in Python, so we have to have batteries included. So what we can actually do is we can hop into a Python interpreter. And then we can manipulate the result sets that we have created in SQL Python at the command line with code in the actual interpreter. And you can exit the interpreter and come back into the interpreter and uh, do the manipulation. You can write Python scripts that you then run against it. Uh, one thing to watch out for, um, and it, it got removed because I needed space, it also says that you can key an SQL in the Python console. I cannot make that work. <laughs> uh, I can't even find a definition for the command. So I get a feeling it's on the to-do list. But as I said, is if you do your query, go into the interpreter, manipulate the results, exit out, do another query, go back in, you can actually um, switch backwards and forwards, because in the end, all your results sets are big globals. Almost there, guys. And so um, the last thing is, um, I know most Python people would say, why would we want anything that Java people thinks is wonderful as a style of doing Python? Um, there is a, a set of libraries out there called Spring Python. Okay, so it models itself a lot on what Spring and Spring Roo do. But you don't have to use the complete thing. And one of the things that I found which was quite nice is they have this concept of database templates. And so one of the annoying things about doing a, um, using the standard DB API is you have to refer to everything by what element is it in the sequence that's being returned. There are various tools like dtuple and stuff, which can give you names, so you can refer to things by names. Um, but they do this really nicely. Um, and this, is a, this only touches, I had to give an example which was relatively easy to read. But it has a dictionary row mapper, so it does the automatic inspection of that description, and then maps all the, the columns to their names, so that then I can just pull them out as a dictionary. And there's one for attributes, uh, so it's quite a, a nice, way of doing it. Um, and as I said, you don't you don't don't want to totally bury yourself in spring style. You you could just use this for certain things. But I'd certainly have a look at it. It's an interesting um, the whole thing is interesting in how they, they do some stuff. Uh, all the credits. Um, I will put the slides up. Okay, so um, I always make sure when I tweet and stuff I'll put hash PyCon, so if you are interested, it'll be up on SlideShare a little bit later on. So are there any questions? No, you can't, no. That's what I'm saying. I had to recreate it from one I printed out. Yeah, it'll be part of the slide deck, so um, yeah. Yeah, originally I was like, I'm hunting, 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 and it goes to nowhere. And I was, I was in panic, and then I found um, stuff in a drawer, the uh, original diagram. I can't believe I've explained it that well. There are shorter ways of getting the, uh, the results to come out as a dictionary, you know, just the single function. Yeah, I mean, well, um, dtuple is one that I use a lot, and even that's gone missing in action. Um, but if you key it, I, I use it in a particular project, so it's actually sitting in one of my code repositories. So, so that, that's a quite nice one. I had too many slides, so I didn't put it in. But you're right, there, there's about three that I, if you Google, um, name columns in Python DB API, you'll get these things returned back. So a lot of people don't like them because you tend to have to make a sort of like a double call. Call the on the first result set to get the description, then wrap it into, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it's, and, and that's what the, what's what the database templates does for you naturally. So um, a lot of people write their own one for it, um, yeah. 
have seen in a lot of software, they use both ORMs as well as yeah, yep. services. Is, is it like a good model? Like, I've started seeing them all. Like, there is use of both ORM as well as features. Yeah, um, I think that's, it's a good, I think it's a good and a bad thing. Um, if you're using the RRM, there's already this connection running and there's already, you're already in this session, okay? And if your RRM doesn't give the ability for you to get to that connection to do the direct SQL stuff, you're in a danger of creating something that's not in the same transaction. So that, that would be my only um, be careful thing. There's no reason that if you're separating them from the concept of being a transaction that at times you, you can't achieve something with your RRM and falling down to the DB API and doing that as part of your, uh, your app uh, is, is, a, is a good thing. Um, you just need to be careful on the web because basically what's happening is uh, in some cases the connection is going up and down, in other cases you're pulling from a connection pool. So you just can't guarantee that you've got the same connection. So um, I know s some RRMs give it to you. Can you get it from yeah, Django? Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. And having written an ORM, it's almost encouraged to drop down to raw SQL because the ORM can't do it, but you don't end up trying to do it. I mean, the ORM essentially will be fast. Yeah. And, and a lot of, lot, of, lot of RRMs will actually just allow you to put the raw SQL in. Yeah. And, that, and for me, that would probably be the better. I, I would almost say that was the selection criteria when you're looking at RRMs, um, that it allows you to go down to the low level, but it's considered part of the RRM. And so, um, Django, you can do it. S um, SQL Alchemy, you can do it. Um, the big difference is you're moving away from your models. Okay, but sometimes it's worthwhile to move away from your models when you're doing very complex joins and things like that. Okay, well, thank you.